This is the SaneSmart Prover XL650 Plus. It's a new 3-axis CNC router with a working area of 600 by 498 millimeters. It has a moving gantry which runs on HG20 linear rails. The Y-axis is driven by a single 10 millimeter lead screw and a NEMA 23 stepper motor with 3.1 newton meters of torque. The gantry is constructed from 100 by 20 millimeter aluminium extrusion. It is supported by 12 millimeter aluminium side plates and the front is covered by a thin alloy dust cover. The Y axis runs on EG15 linear rails and it is also driven by a 10 millimeter lead screw with a NEMA 23 stepper motor. The Z or Z axis runs on 20 millimeter linear rods rather than linear rails, but these are quite substantial. The table bed is constructed from aluminium and MDF plates and these form T-slots which can be used for holding down material with the supplied clamps. A 300 watt 52 mm spindle motor is supplied which has an ER11 collet and a top speed of 12,000 RPM. For improved performance a trim router or VFD type spindle can be installed using the additional 65 mm spindle holder. The control electronics are built into a steel case with a knob for the spindle speed, an emergency stop switch, the USB connection, an IEC power connector and connectors for the stepper motors, limit switches and spindle motor. This is what we have under the lid. There is a power supply. The stepper motor drivers are located under the heatsink. There is a relay to control power to the spindle motor. The microcontroller is a Holtec HD32F50241, which is a part of their ARM Cortex M0 32-bit range. The microcontroller runs a version of Gerbil. Gerbil is open source firmware designed to interpret G-code commands and control stepper motors. The control box is connected to the machine with a cable assembly, which is routed through cable chains. The machine was also supplied with a set of tools for assembly, spanners to tighten the spindle collet, a height probe, clamps, a USB cable, power leads, a USB stick, sample materials, and a set of end mills. Overall, the user manual is pretty good. So now let's assemble the machine. Next, we're going to look at the software, but before we do that, a quick message from today's video sponsor. PCBWay are best known for their high quality, affordable, rapid manufacturing services, including PCB design, manufacture and assembly, with prototype PCBs available from $5 for 10 units and assembly available from $30 for 20 units. PCBWay are currently running their fifth PCB design contest with some fantastic prizes for original projects that include a PCB design. Other services include CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding. This includes 3, 4 and 5 axis milling with a wide range of materials and finishes. To get a quote just select the process, select the material and the options. PCB Way is a one stop shop for your project needs. For more information check the link in the description. The software and drivers are provided on a USB stick. To start with I created a directory on the C drive. and then copied all of the files into it. The USB driver was installed first. The 
USB cable was plugged into the laptop. And then I ran Gerbil Control Candle. Candle is used to control the machine and send G code to it. The USB COM port was selected under Service Settings. The machine starts in a locked state, which is to remind us to home the machine. So we select the unlock button and then the home button. Or you can actually just select home without unlocking first. The machine homes to the back right hand corner. Next, we're going to set up the height probe using it to measure its own height. To do this, I pasted the first part of the existing probe script command into user command button one. What this script does is to initiate a G38.2 G code probe command, which moves the Z axis downwards until the end mill makes electrical contact with the probe touch plate. The user command panel is enabled to make the user buttons visible. An end mill is installed into the spindle collet and a metal plate is placed underneath it. The touch plate is placed upside down on top of the metal and the crock clip is connected to the end mill. User command button one is then selected, which initiates the script with the G38.2 probe command, which stops when it makes electrical contact with the metal plate. Now we zero the Z axis coordinate. Turn the probe touch plate over. Select command button one again. And then the Z axis coordinate gives us the height of the touch plate, which in this case is 19.05 millimeters. So now what we need to do is to update the original probe script with the value that we just measured. And finally, we can give it a test by zeroing the Z axis to the surface of this lovely piece of MDF. The spindle motor is supplied with a 1 8 of an inch ER11 collet. It's worth buying a set of different sizes and they can be installed by clicking them into the collet nut. Next, I designed a spore board in Fusion 360. It uses M6 threaded inserts located in a 52 mm grid pattern. The spore board was made from 18 mm or 3 quarter of an inch MDF. The holes were drilled using drill bits. and the recessed areas cut with an end mill. The threaded inserts were installed into the holes. The spore board was bolted to the table bed using bolts, washers and T-nuts. And then a 22 mm flat end mill was used to level the spore board, zeroing the Z-axis to the lowest area. Now that the spore board is level, let's have a go at making something. I've designed a French cleat drill holder in Fusion 360. It's going to be made out of nominal 12 mm or half inch thick plywood. But to ensure that the parts fit together properly, I'm going to measure its exact thickness. To do that, I'm going to use the probe, starting off with the probe touch plate on the spore board surface and selecting user button one. This runs a script we created earlier, which initiates a G38.2 probe command. The z-axis is now zeroed. The plywood we're going to use is placed on the spoil board and the probe touch plate is placed on top. User button one is selected again. And the z-axis work coordinate gives us the plywood thickness, which in this case is 11.288 millimeters. I've included a parameter for plywood thickness in the model, so that was updated. The next thing we need to figure out is the slot width required to give the best fitting joints. So I've created a test model with three slots. The first slot has the same width as the plywood. The second is increased by 0.1 millimeters. 
and the third by 0.2 millimeters. I'm going to use a 1 8 of an inch compression end mill for all of the milling. Compression end mills are designed to cut sheet material cleanly. They have an up cut flute geometry from the tip, converting to a down cut flute geometry further on. For each slot, we're starting with a 2D adaptive toolpath. And then finishing with a 2D pocket toolpath. The result was that adding 0.1 millimeters gives the best fit. Next, I'm going to attach the plywood to the spore board with painter's tape and mitre adhesive, applying CA glue to one side and spraying activator on the other. This results in a very strong attachment. Then I'm going to zero the Z axis on the surface of the plywood. Zero the X, Y axis at the bottom left hand corner, load the G code. and send it to the machine. So that's the first sheet finished. The compression end mill has done its job with little or no edge cleanup required. For the second sheet, I decided to add a makeshift edge finder. It's just a steel angle bracket with a jumper lead and crop clip, which is screwed into the bottom left hand corner of the scoreboard. I added a couple of macros to the user command buttons. The machine was homed. The Z axis zeroed. The angle bracket was connected to the probe touch plate with the jumper lead. User button 2 was selected to zero the Y axis and user button 3 to zero the X axis. A dust shoe that I had ordered from Amazon arrived. It attached to the spindle motor with two grub screws and the parts were held together with magnets. That was connected to a shop vac via dust separator. And then the G code for the second sheet was loaded and sent to the machine. Next, I tested aluminium. I created some pocket tests in Fusion 360 with 2D adaptive roughing toolpaths. 
and a 1 of an inch single flute end mill. All of the tool paths start with a 2 degree helix, cutting down to the final depth of 2 millimeters and then cutting the pockets with different optimal loads and feed rates. Now let's upgrade the spindle motor. I'm going to use a 1.5 kilowatt VFD or variable frequency drive powered unit with an ER11 collet and water cooling. The spindle has a speed range of between 8 and 24,000 RPM and initially it will be manually controlled. The diameter of the spindle is 65 millimeters, so we can use the 65 millimeter holder that was supplied with the kit. For the cooling, I'm using a bucket, water pump, tubing, and deionized water. I've also installed an air nozzle to clear chips away from the end mill. Now let's try cutting some aluminium. I have a 51mm or 2 inch square block of 6082T6 which needs to be faced. So I'm going to use it to test some different depths and feed rates. To that end I've created a facing toolpath in Fusion 360. Starting with the same single flute 1 8 of an inch end mill and a speed of 24,000 RPM.
Finally, I've created a test model, which I'm going to cut out the block of aluminium. To help contain the aluminium chips, I've added a temporary fence. The job starts off with a facing toolpath. Then a 2D adaptive toolpath to remove the bulk of the material from the outside of the ring. There was some chatter on the left hand side of this toolpath and I think the fix for this is to reduce the depth of cut. Next was a contour toolpath to clean up the edge of the ring. And a pocket toolpath to clean up the outside face. Then the process was repeated on the inside. During the tests, I found a compatibility problem between the G-code produced by the Fusion 360 post processor and the Gerbil firmware used by the machine. The problem was that the comments that the post processor puts into the G-code would lock or crash the Gerbil firmware. I think that this should probably be fixed in the firmware, but my solution was to edit the post processor and comment out the line that writes those comments to the G-code file. That works, and if you need it, the link to the updated post processor is in the video description. Okay, so what do I think about this machine? The things that I'm impressed with are that the machine has a good working area, which is big enough to make some furniture items or cut multiple parts from one sheet of material. It has a good Z-axis travel and clearance, and it has linear rails on the X and Y axes. On the less positive front, the use of a single lead screw on the Y axis could potentially lead to racking, although to be fair, it does seem to work okay. The gantry is not quite as robust as it initially looks, with 100 by 20 millimeter aluminium extrusion forming the main structure. The wiring connectors do not have cable strain relief, but they do at least clip together. And finally, the cabling could be longer. I found the length quite restrictive. Overall, it's a decent solid machine. I do like it, and I would recommend it primarily for cutting wood and plastics. So I hope that was useful. Thanks for watching, and see you again next time.